Hi, this is Carl Polchuk. Welcome to another SMB Community Podcast. I'm joined today by my good friend, James Kernan. How are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing great, Carl. Good to be here with you. Well, I put on these glasses just for you. James is Mr. Sales Coach, so uh, he, he really liked these the last Show me the morning. money. Show me the money. <laughs> Show me the money. <laughs> so, uh, so for folks who haven't seen you before, why don't you uh, give a little introduction to who you are and how you got here? Great, great. Thank you. Um, so Carl and I go way back. You know, I've been in the uh, coaching community for over 12 years. Uh, but prior to that, I was probably just like uh, those of you listening in where I ran, uh, you know, my own managed service provider and technology company. So uh, early in my career for about the first Around the first 12, 13 years, I worked with uh, three big uh, West Coast-based, uh, you know, firms. You know, one helped grow from about eight million to 32 million. The next one was about 30 million when I joined, and we grew as I was their VP of Sales. We grew over 300 million, uh, so big, uh, big growth spurt there. And then, um, then finally, I went off on my own. I wasn't a partner anymore, and. Uh, formed my own company. I bought a little CRM company in San Diego that was struggling and they were about $300,000 in sales. And I grew that to over 12 million and sold it. So uh, uh, at that point in time, uh, that was in 2006 um, and uh, broke off and started coaching and training and, and mentoring uh, CEOs. Uh, been loving that and doing that for the past 12 years. Very cool. You know, it's so funny because a lot of people are at the $300,000 level. Yeah. You know, that's the, you know, it's not that that's easy, but it's not super difficult. And people who are not even quite there can see how to get to 300,000. Right. Um, but going to 30 million and then going to 300 million, like that just seems impossible. So, so what makes it possible for somebody to have that kind of growth? Do you just stop paying attention to service and just do sales or? <laughs> yeah, so great, great question. It, um, uh, you know, in, in those organizations, I mean, first and foremost, I'll just say it, it, all, it all starts up in your head. You know, you have to make a conscious decision that, hey, I'm no longer going to be a help desk or a tech shop, but I'm going to be a sales and marketing company. So when I bought that company I was just describing in, in San Diego, I was written up in all sorts of magazines by being this extraordinary marketeer. But truth be told, I had to because nobody knew who we were. Nobody was going to just, you know, randomly look up, you know, my company, Networks Plus, and the Yellow Pages. You know, sure, I knew a lot of people, but uh, we had to get very aggressive with our marketing campaigns, we worked very closely with our vendor partners and, and did a lot of co-marketing with our strategic partners. And then, you know, we, uh, we led with service and on that consulting side, but we also sold a lot of product and it's, you know, we, we, we did both. And, uh, when we're talking, you know, hundred million, 200, 300 million, uh, you know, that's a lot of product that you're pushing out the door as well. So it's, that's kind of a different level, but, you know, you're right. I work with a lot of small business owners and they're just kind of stuck on this plateau and they can't really get over it. And it always seems to be, you know, the 200 or 300,000 and then 500,000 and then the, the $1 million mark, right? Right. The magic million. Yep. The magic million. And then it always seemed, you know, two and a half million and then 5 million, but it, it never ends. Uh, but, you know, some of the stuff we'll talk about today uh, will help shed some light on how I made it fun and uh, things that I do with companies that I coach to motivate employees to help you take that business up to the next level. All right. So I asked you today to come here and talk to us about gamification yep. and, and how we can use that. Cause it, online it makes sense, right? I'm, I'm putting together a community so I can give you a badge. If you, you know, participate in the forums, I can give you a badge if you finish a certain program. Um, but that, it's not the same as with your technicians, right? You, you can't walk around handing out, you know, uh, little medals that you printed up yourself. <laughs> well, you, you can, <laughs> you can, but uh, I'm, I'm talking a little bit different version of gamification, but 
kind of going, going back in time a little bit, just a little bit more about me and how I'm programmed. Uh, first and foremost, I, you know, highly competitive athlete, you know, all the way through college. And then I also love numbers and I'm, uh, you know, a, a finance major, love numbers and statistics, and I love analyzing that. So that's kind of where those two worlds, you know, competitiveness and, uh, and numbers come into play. And I wanted, now how do you motivate employees to act like business owners? Now I've always, I've always, uh, you know, thought about that. And for me, it was really making work fun. So besides me creating a culture where I help people, you know, meet and exceed their goals, I always wanted to make work fun. And some of the things I learned early in my career, even before I became a business owner, uh, was, you know, some of the, the versions uh, of, of gamification. And, you know, somebody would walk into the office and say, hey, whoever makes the, the most cold calls here before noon, you know, gets a free sub sandwich. And, and Carl, that's all I had to hear. You know, I just, I dropped <laughs> everything I was doing and I was always hungry anyway. You know, I eat like a horse, but, but I, I was always so competitive and I wanted to finish in first in everything that I did, but I always made it fun. And I was always a team player and I'd encourage people around me because it, it motivated me the harder other people push me too. So uh, anyway, it was um, really in production environments, like where you have salespeople, engineering teams, or even help desks, uh, you need to create goals, right, and KPIs that you're going to measure. And then I like creating what, what's called transparency management, where either up on dashboards or daily reports, I wanted to make all these numbers public and then reward people for good behavior, reward people for being the top producers. And uh, my philosophy as a, as a leader in business, I would always, uh, you know, praise in public and scold in private. So I, I wanted everybody to focus on all the good things happening. So we had dashboards and reports all over my offices and clients that I work with. That's some of the first things that I do is I want to, you know, we always set goals, um, put it in writing, you know, help train the employees how to meet and exceed the goals. And then really the accountability part is this gamification. And um, uh, so let me, let me take a minute. So yeah. KPIs are key performance indicators. Yep. And so what are some of the KPIs that you want folks to focus on? Because, you know, we, we open up uh, AutoTask or SolarWinds or ConnectWise and we see a dashboard and you can have all of the little spinning things and whatever. Um, but I think most people focus on how many tickets they have in the queue and uh, how many hours they build today and that sort of thing. That's right. completely different from sales. Right. So um, two answers to that. I guess first and foremost, I, I have a, a list. It's probably four pages long of all the different KPIs that, uh, that you can use to run your business. And it's, you know, in finance and sales and, you know, accounting, engineering, there's all these different things that you can look at. And, and then in bold, I always put the, and normally there's about five or six of them in each one of the departments. Uh, I'm happy to share that with your community. I can email you over a copy or people could just email my office. I'm happy to share that free of charge with, with everybody because that's, I think, good stuff. But just to keep things simple, especially when you're applying it into uh, gamification is, you know, I wanted to know the number of calls, the number of meetings, the number of proposals, and then booked gross profit and booked revenue. So it starts with the funnel, the sales funnel, but then goes to the actual delivery. Exactly. Exactly. And you can do that with your accounting, you know, project management, help desk. Uh, there's a lot of fun things that you can track, but uh, we'll talk about sales, for example, today. And I would start at the top of the funnel. And it normally was things, um, everybody always confuses this. Uh, in most organizations, you should have two different departments, a, a marketing department and a sales department. Marketing will do outreach, right, and attract leads back into the company. And when a prospect comes into the company, that's what I call it, a marketing qualified lead or an right. MQL. Right. And we pass that off to sales, and then sales picks up the phone and they qualify it. And then that becomes a sales qualified lead, right? 
So, you know, that's the number of contacts or calls. And a lot of salespeople are making their own outbound calls or should be uh, calling warm contacts. Uh, of course, leads that come in from marketing like MQLs, but really good and high performance salespeople that produce in those multi-million dollar environments, you know, they create their own leads and they scrape LinkedIn and they go to events and, um, you know, they know a lot of people. So that's, right. that's who you want. But those are basic things that you'd want to track. So like number of calls, number of meetings are really important. Uh, the number of quotes and then, you know, booked uh, gross profit and booked revenue. Those were, those were the five big ones that I would recommend. And so do you have like an online dashboard or do you encourage people to like put posters up on the wall and, you know, color them in with uh, <laughs> who's doing what? Yeah, so that's the cool thing about what's really evolved in our marketplace today. There's so many, all these PSA tools, um, you know, and then there's a lot of other, you know, like Bright Gauge. There's so many other dashboard connectors to your PSAs that can push that data out there. What I found, Carl, a lot of people don't have those active and they don't really use those. So uh, I like leveraging the uh, technology that they've already purchased and then just helping them get that data up in a usable format. Uh, there's lots of other offices. I've seen people roll it out and I'll walk in and I'll look up on the board and go, Oh, you got 72 tickets that are past due. And what are all these red things mean? Right. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, my boss put that up there and you know, and then you start laughing and it's like, Oh boy, I got a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but the cool thing is today you can have real time dashboards that serve the data up. And, it, and if you don't have a PSA, that's okay. I mean, you track it on a spreadsheet and put it up on a piece of paper, or even if you have a weekly meeting, uh, you know, whenever I ran my sales meetings, I would always start very first thing. I would come in with my spreadsheet and I'd walk right on up to the board and I'd start writing the numbers down and I would compare the actual performance to date this month to what the goal is for this month. And I'd always start with that. I would highlight all the people doing really well. And the neat thing about transparency management and gamification is you don't need to say a word to the people that aren't producing very well. Because right. all the peers do a good job of poking them in the ribs, right? <laughs> like, oh, look at John, he's on vacation. He's got a goose egg. So that, that's why I make, I, you know, I try to make it fun and encouraging, but uh, I like making it transparent. So, um, you know, one of the things I do is track all of our sales. We have a sales tracking sheet and uh, my assistant puts things in there and it's it, at the bottom, it literally lists uh, the percentage of our goal for the month. And then she's got a table she could look up and you're like, uh, this month has uh, whatever, 30 days, right? So uh, if you're on day 27 out of 30, it's X percent and, you know, then compare that to where we are with sales and you can literally tell in real time, are you ahead of sales or behind sales goal for the month? Right. But, but where do you come up with the goal, right? Do you just spin a wheel like, Hey, you know, uh, $40,000 seems like a really good goal. Let's, yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, yeah, I've been doing this so long. I, I know what to expect from people so I can help people create goals really quickly. Uh, if you're new to creating goals, I would just say uh, either one, take your business plan goal that you created from the top down. And, you know, I want to do a million dollars of revenue this year and divide it amongst your producers. You could kind of do some simple math there or look at how you performed last year and add 20% to it. Um, you know, you could go that way. A couple other important pieces I want to share with you is gamification works really well. One, if you, if you tap into the competitive spirit of people and you, you need something to compare to. So in an environment where there's one salesperson, you know, it, it doesn't work very well. Right. They, you need, you need, you know, two, three, four, the more the merrier, because uh, then people would like, hey, I'm going to be the number three guy or I'm going to be the number two guy or the number one. Uh, that works really well. And another important piece is uh, it doesn't always have to be compensation, but for uh, in, in our industry, as you know, a lot of people are coin operated. So, you know, salespeople like making lots of money and the high end engineers are used to making lots of money. 
And uh, I liked having some type of compensation tied into gamification of them meeting and exceeding their goals. So um, I think I think incentive plans are important. Uh, and then uh, obviously you need a team of you know two or more so they have something to compare it to. So what about folks who have uh, a bunch of text? Should they use gamification just to motivate the text to have uh, you know? Do their, do their tickets on time and to have high billability and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I, think, that's, uh, I think that's super important. You know, it, the, the statistics that I've monitored when, when, when we've implemented these programs in businesses, over 90% of the time they've seen, uh, uh, you know, motivated employees and they perform at a higher level. The, the very first company that I rolled this out, it was actually, I won't name names, but it was, um, you know, one of the companies that I was a sales leader in Southern California, uh, an engineer one-on-one, -on -one, I rolled out the program and said, you know, hey, your, your uh, salaries are going to be a little bit lower, but I, I have an uncapped commission plan where you can make two, three, four times more money than you've ever made before. And this person came to me and he, and he physically cried. And he was like, I can't do that. You know, you're, you're, it's unrealistic. And I was like, no, no, it isn't real unrealistic. I just came from a company where we did this. I believe in you. You're a superstar. You know, I just want to help motivate you to get up to the next level. And, and truth be told, you know, he doubled his compensation in the next uh, 12 months from what he was before just because he had a game to play and incentives wow. to shoot after. But, uh, Absolutely, you can do that in, in help desks or engineering uh, teams. And again, it doesn't always have to be, you know, monetary. You know, you could buy people lunches or badges or, uh, you know, uniforms, you know, shirts. Uh, early in my career, there was um, actually my first sales job, Carl. There was, uh, it's kind of tied to this, but the owner came up to me and I, I noticed he had a really cool pair of cowboy boots on. And, uh, you know, I was maybe a couple years out of college and wow, those are really cool. <laughs> and what kind are they? And they were like these really cool elk boots. And he said, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what size are you? And I'm, I don't know, a 10, you know, and in the back of my mind, I'm going, wow, why would he ask that? Right. Well, you know, a week later I come into the office and on my desk was a, a brand new pair of elk boots, you know, size 10. And he just was rewarding me for what I had done uh, that, that prior week because I was one of the top producers there. And I just always thought that kind of stuff was cool. And that actually meant more to me than him giving me cash. Uh, you know, at that moment, it just meant more to me because he followed through on something that I wanted and I thought was cool. I just thought that was unique. And so, how do you go about figuring out what will motivate people? Because, I mean, if you think about it, you know, you, I'm sure you've read Drive by Daniel Pink. People yep. are motivated by autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And after they reach a certain uh, amount of income, mm -hmm. money isn't more of a motivator, right? But right. Uh, you and I both know as business owners, sometimes it's about it, the game. I mean, literally, like, I may or may not need more money, but if I can get just the right marketing program, you know, <laughs> As an owner, I'm, you know, I'm going to win the game. Uh, right. How do you translate that to employees? Because they, you know, they don't get the extra profit. So, um, you know, so before I forget, I'm going to answer that question, but I, I also want to walk through, there's a five-step plan of implementing gamification. In your okay, business. absolutely. Make sure I go through that. But a key component of that, again, is, you know, I always took the responsibility as the business owner or as a manager that I wanted to know what motivated my employees. I want to get to know them a little bit more. So I would deliberately, you know, at, at the time of hiring and onboarding and training and managing, I always wanted to find out what they wanted to become in, in the business, what motivated them, where they want to take their career three years from now, five years from now. And I always kind of put it upon myself where I'm going to help you get there. You know, I, I hope you stay here on part of my team, but I always wanted to help people reach their goals and, and, and find out what makes them tick. Uh, in some companies that I worked with and for, you know, we did a lot of personality testing and, and things like that, and that will help uh, determine that. But uh, I think it's important just for you as the business owner or business leader 
to find out what makes your, your employees tick and you just got to spend face time with them and ask them those questions. Alrighty. So let's have your five points. So the, the, the five points real quick, I'm, I'll just walk through these quickly. The first step really is identifying the goals for each employee in the department that you want to track. Okay, so it always starts with the plan. What are the goals going to be? And you asked about that a moment ago. An important piece is not just the department goals or what the company wants. The spirit of competition is driven individually. So, you know, you always want to uh, make a big deal about the team meeting the team goal. But I wanted to make a big deal because in most companies, and pardon the expression, I always joked uh, in secret, you know, there's a, a, a couple aces and a lot of spaces. <laughs> So there, you want to reward those high producers and keep them motivated and, and retain them, right? So uh, it's important to create for each employee individual goals and then the team goal, okay? So that was number one. Uh, number two, it's uh, part of that skills gap where you really need to determine uh, if they've had the proper training and, and skills education that they're going to meet and exceed uh, those goals. And sometimes you can't just roll gamification out and ram it down everybody's throat because, you know, for example, the goal is $40,000 a month and I haven't had training on how to make a cold call or closing techniques or how to manage the, the sales process is pretty hard to hold people accountable when you haven't trained them. So to me, the training part and uh, just reviewing if they're equipped with the tools, the resources and the training to meet and exceed your goals. So that's, that's number two. Number three is you really need to design the game around the employees. And you, you kind of hit it on the head a moment ago by what motivates them. Uh, so that's, uh, that's important. Number four, you know, make, a, make the purpose clear to the employees with weekly reinforcement and what I call transparency. So you want to keep the data, you know, just like you're, say, uh, a sp older gentlemen, or I want to lose five pounds, you know, by the end of the month. You know, I don't, I don't starve myself all month long. And then at the end of the month, I get on the scale, you know, it's not how you would do it. You would get on the scale once, twice a day. I want to see on a regular basis how I'm doing. So that kind of consistent feedback, I think is really important to keep people motivated and keep them going and keep that competitive spirit uh, happening as well. So that was number four. And then number five was reward timely and consistently. So if you have weekly meetings and uh, maybe you pay commissions or incentives on a monthly basis, it's really important to make sure that you give praise out during those weekly meetings. If somebody's a superstar, you know, try to do it daily and point out the, you know, hey, you did a fantastic job. Uh, I used to love uh, walking around the office and pouring coffee in people's cups or high-fiving them. Uh, and just getting the energy going in the office uh, when people are doing well, and then pay those commissions timely. You know, you want to make sure that happens. Yeah, that's a good point. So should should the weekly meeting be just with the sales people, or should it be like pointing out the sales people in the middle of a company-wide meeting? Yeah, great question. So I would always recommend to have individual team meetings based on the size of your organization. Some of you may be listening in are, are, are quite small. Maybe you want to have an all hands meeting. Um, but I would, I was always a structure person. So let's just pretend it's at 815 every Monday, I would start the meeting on time and end the meeting on time. And whoever was supposed to be there is supposed to be there. I'm not going to wait for people because uh, it's disrespectful to everybody else who was there on time. But uh, typically uh, with organizations that I work with, you normally would have it with the individual departments uh, and you would have like a weekly meeting with the engineering or service team and a weekly meeting with the uh, sales team. Those are typically the two teams that one are larger and two uh, have programs like this in place. Yeah, when I had... 12 people, we would do a manager's meeting that was super brief on Monday morning, like 15 minutes, yep. followed by an all company meeting, followed by breaking into the different departments. So, right. um, and uh, for the goal setting, is that, is the goal setting done quarterly or is that done weekly? So um, I would, I would recommend, I always looked at the numbers from an, an annual basis and part of the exercise I work with clients on a one-on-one -on -one or in our peer groups 
is we, we look at the goals on an annual basis, but then they're reviewed on a quarterly basis. So you can, you can bump them and change them, but uh, most of the time I would leave them in place for the year unless somebody's failing miserably or they're just blowing it out. Um, I think annually but, is... But you expect, I mean, it, but, I mean, 20%, I think, is a, that's a healthy growth rate. So if you, but it's a number that you mentioned earlier. But if you expect 20% growth, uh, January is going to be down here, but December is going to be up here. So, yeah. So that's a that's a that's a great point. Normally, uh, when you when you get down to that level, you can look at the cycles of your business in previous financials, and you know, like you just said, normally the beginning of the year is kind of slower. The end of spring, summer, fall get busy, and then the very tail end of the year. I mean, that's just the cycle in technology. That's what I've seen primarily with. Uh, commercial accounts, but, um, uh, you know, I worked for some other big companies that their the cycle was a little bit different because, you know, the educational market fiscal year ends the end of June, you know, the federal, uh, fiscal year end is end of September. Uh, so, you know, it's ideal, like the big company I worked for, we on purpose had a very diverse portfolio of clients. So our revenue was kind of a steady like that. Uh, really the only off month would be maybe the tail end of December and beginning of January, but historically it was fairly consistent. Very cool. So we're almost out of time. Let me uh, let you chat a bit about the services you offer. So you have peer groups, you have uh, a billionaire mastermind. Is that what it is? Trillionaire now. Trillionaire <laughs> mastermind. <laughs> yeah. Nowadays with inflation, we all have to be trillionaires, but uh but yeah, so I, I still do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching with people. I, I love that. I uh, get a lot of uh, joy from helping people uh, grow their business and change their life. So one-on-one -on -one business practice. I have a peer group community uh, that I partnered up with a fellow coach, uh, Chris Weiser, uh, called the Millionaire Mastermind Peer Groups. And then an, uh, another more of an online training program called the Three Steps to My First Million. Uh, and that's more of a training online peer group so love doing those peer groups as well. Uh, we're having a lot of fun with that and had just spun that up here a few months back. So do you work with um, companies of all sizes or does somebody, should somebody be at whatever, 1 million, 5 million, you know, where, where should somebody be to engage you? Yeah. Um, great question. Really, I'm, I'm not really picky or choosy. I've worked in all sorts of environments from one person shop starting up to, you know, hundred million dollar plus resellers. I've worked all across there. I would just say my normal client is anywhere between a million and 10 million kind of in that sweet spot. Um, and pretty much, I think what uh, people are attracted to, you know, if they want to grow their business and they need help with sales and marketing and strategic planning, those are uh, strengths of mine that uh, would love to implement uh, for those of you that are listening in. Very cool. Well, for those of you who don't know, James and I belong to a, a mastermind together with several other people. And so we get together about once a month online and uh, occasionally in, in real life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so, um, you know, I, I encourage you to get in touch with him and it's, kernanconsulting.com and uh, see what programs he's got that might be able to help you. Great. Great. And if folks have um, questions or whatever, is there an email link or a contact link on that website? I don't want to really broadcast your email address. Yeah, there's a contact us page right on, right on the website. So just at kernanconsulting.com. Uh, would love to hear from you and, uh, you know, happy to respond personally and, and talk with folks. Uh, so far away. Very good. Well, thank you, sir. Thanks for being with us today. I certainly appreciate your time. You bet. Thanks, Carl. This was great.